Any longtime video game fan probably has at least a few favorite classic tunes. And for a lot of us, it's even our favorite category of music, encompassing a wide array of styles and allowing us to relive memories of a game simply by listening. In the early to mid 90s, I used to make my own audio cassette soundtracks by putting a recorder up to my mono TV speaker and even made some copies for friends. It's fun to remember, but once I got my first CD player, I never looked back. But of course, CDs have arguably been outdated for a pretty long while themselves, and it's easy to understand why most people prefer to not deal with physical media for music anymore. And yet, here I am with this shelf. I just can't let it go, and I continue to add a few more soundtracks to it every year. I rarely listen to the actual discs anymore, but I do like having the option to go back to the source myself and rip my own high-quality files in whatever way I choose. But beyond that, I've been thinking lately about how a lot of people may have never even seen some of the packaging and unique artwork in many of these sets, and that many others may not even know that some of the most recent game music disc sets exist. So let's take a look at the physical media for a bunch of video game soundtracks. has never been and maybe never will be quite mainstream. Generally speaking, the good stuff has to be imported from Japan. But back in the day, I bought a couple of soundtracks I saw at EB Games, though they're pretty disappointing in that the ones I have are a single CD each and do not have complete track listings. Some of my other non-import soundtracks are much more satisfying. In fact, my first ever game soundtrack CD was Super Mario 64, which came for free with a Nintendo Power subscription and luckily has all of the music from the game. And Best Buy gave away a relatively complete Banjo-Kazooie soundtrack along with pre-orders. But you could order a lot of the other American version Nintendo CDs from Nintendo Power catalogs. They're a bit hit or miss though. This single disc Ocarina of Time pales in comparison to the two disc Japanese version because none of the tracks loop. The Diddy Kong Racing and Yoshi's Story CDs are kind of unique though. Unfortunately, they're dangerous to use in tray or self-loading disc drives, so they're fairly useless unless you still use a top-loading CD player. I do hope the folks from the original Shape CD Incorporated are doing well these days. Unfortunately, the only Donkey Kong Country CD I have is for three. Because the music is so good, we're putting this music on a CD. You know, something that's big in Japan for many, many years is game music on CD. It hasn't been a big hit in America because maybe the music hasn't been quite up to what you hear on the on the radio is every daytime, you're gonna lose it, dude. One of my greatest soundtrack collection regrets is that I never bought Nintendo Power's other Donkey Kong Country CDs or the trilogy set, and they're considered very rare and valuable nowadays. What can I say? I was a Nintendo only kid until the late 90s, but I did start expanding my horizons and getting into RPGs, which I'm sure is the premier soundtrack subcategory for a lot of people. Final Fantasy alone takes up a huge amount of my soundtrack shelf space, with at least one set to represent every numbered Final Fantasy, all the way up through 15 so far. I've also got some CDs for non-numbered Final Fantasies and several of the remix and orchestra versions too. Although I have to admit, I've made a few mistakes over the years, and not all of them are authentic releases, but we'll talk more about that later. Speaking of Final Fantasy, something you might run into with modern releases are Blu-ray versions. For Final Fantasy XV, I opted against the Blu-ray release and went for the traditional 4-disc CD version. But when it comes to Final Fantasy XIV, it's pretty unavoidable. Square Enix released some CDs for the failed 1.0 version called Field Tracks and Battle Tracks, which are solo Nobuo Oimatsu compositions by the way. But everything that has come since the game was reborn under the direction of Naoki Yoshida has been released only on Blu-ray, if you want physical media anyway. When you insert these into a Blu-ray player, it comes up as a regular video disc. You can listen to the full soundtrack this way and enjoy the game's concept art on your TV, but through the disc menu you can create an IP address on your home network 
that you can log into via your web browser and transfer high quality MP3 versions encoded at 320 kilobits per second straight from the disc in your player. And of course, a Blu-ray can hold a ton of music. I was surprised that the bass soundtrack for A Realm Reborn lasted me for most of a nine hour car trip. It does feel to me like a less viable method for ripping the disc if you want to call it that, but for now I find it to be an acceptable option if there's no other choice for physical media. Square Enix has also in recent years released some official remix CDs, the SQ series, which are produced in a variety of styles. I especially like the SQ Chips albums. A lot of RPG soundtracks are two, three, and often four discs. They often come in slipcases and have extra artwork inside. One of my favorite things is when they get creative with the disc art. Persona 5 is a great example with each of the three discs featuring the three forms the main character uses in the game. Now, generally speaking, these great multi-disc RPG soundtracks were only released in Japan, but Corey actually has a few that got American versions too. When I was a kid, I'd always read about game soundtracks being released in Japan and lamented that stuff like that would never happen here. For the longest time, I'd get my game soundtrack fixed by listening to the Redbook audio on Sega CD games. Everything changed when I saw that Squaresoft was publishing a couple of their own soundtracks for release in North America. It took me about 20 seconds to decide that I had to have them and ordered two. Secret of Mana and Kefka's Domain, which is the complete soundtrack for Final Fantasy III. Yeah, I know this is actually FF6, but sorry everyone, the Super NES release will always be Final Fantasy III to me. Anyway, for the most part, these tend to be identical to their Japanese counterparts with some original, if minimal, artwork that mimics their US box art. This is great for the mana soundtrack. The main trio at the base of the mana tree is a striking image to this day. You can look at this and practically hear the music playing all around you. With Kepka's Domain, this doesn't quite have the same impact. The Final Fantasy III box art is one of the stranger choices that Squaresoft made at the time. But if you played Final Fantasy III, then you knew exactly how significant getting a 3-disc soundtrack release was. This is one of the best OSTs on the Super NES. Artwork-wise, everything else about these releases is fairly bare-bones. There is no real disc art at all, opting instead for a simple track listing overlaid on a solid color. These soundtracks tend to fetch decently high prices on eBay, although for all intents and purposes, the content of the discs are identical to their Japanese counterpart. The real novelty is that these are official US releases, and that alone makes them worth having. Things sure have changed since 1994, though. If you told me back then that not only would game soundtracks be easy and accessible to purchase in the US, but that releasing game music on, of all things, records would be big business, I probably would have said, what, they still make those? To most people, the thought of taking digital music and putting it onto an analog audio medium may not seem like progress, but I think that there's a lot of audiophiles out there that might disagree. Of course, I wanted to see what the fuss was all about, but none of the releases were really catching my interest. It wasn't until Data Discs, a company based out of London, England, put a heavy focus on soundtracks released by Sega. Their first releases were Shenmue, and more relevant to my interests, the iconic Streets of Rage. Genesis fans know how difficult it can be to reproduce its Yamaha FM synth without original hardware, and thus the music is sourced directly from various models of Mega Drives. Data Discs followed up with some absolutely must-have releases, like OutRun, Shinobi 3, and of course, Streets of Rage 2. The packaging, the artwork, 
which is often a big draw of vinyl releases in the first place, are pretty spectacular. They even come with some materials which are fantastic for framing. The records themselves often have multiple variants, standard black and limited editions that are usually a psychedelic pattern that look great spinning on your turntable. So this is a pretty slippery slope and lots of companies are putting out these officially licensed vinyl soundtracks and it can become a bit overwhelming. One of my favorites is the Snatcher soundtrack from the Brooklyn-based Ship to Shore. This one has some seriously awesome artwork. Having this makes it slightly easier to deal with the fact that I sold my copy of the game years ago. Mondo, who are perhaps most well known for their original film screen prints, got into the video game vinyl business with the Castlevania series. Even though the first Castlevania has arguably the best soundtrack in the series, the release is a little disappointing. The songs on it don't loop at all, and it kind of makes for a blink and it's over experience. They learned their lesson after that and expanded them greatly. Their release for Castlevania 3 is so cool. It's two records, one featuring the NES version, and the other, the Japanese version in all its VRC6 sound expansion chip glory. Let's not forget about I Am 8-Bit and Brave Wave, who have some awesome looking releases, but alas, I don't have any. Yet. For me, listening to music on vinyl makes for a much more involved experience that I've come to appreciate more and more. Whether you think that video game soundtracks on vinyl are cool, or simply make no sense at all, it's really fun to think about how it's all come around to this. Yeah, all that vinyl stuff is super cool. I just love that it exists, but I don't think it's really for me. So anyway, a few other CD sets that I have that I think are worth looking at. One of the more extravagant soundtracks I have is for Okami. Not only is it a beautiful box with lots of artwork inside, but it's a whopping five discs. And one of the best parts is that each disc is surrounded by different characters from the game. Mystical Ninja starring Goemon is one of my favorite third-party games for the N64, and it has hands down one of the best soundtracks on the system. So naturally, when I saw I could order the CD way back then, I did. Little did I know that it must have been a pretty low print run, and I learned not long ago from Kurt Collada of Hardcore Gaming 101 that the soundtrack is worth just over $1,000 on the Japanese collector's market. I kinda wanna keep it, but Part of me also likes the idea of going on being like a ticket to Japan to cover the cost of travel. Of course, sometimes CDs might be included with the game, either in a special edition or as a pre-order bonus. I really hate it when it's just a five or six track sampler, but more robust pack-in CDs certainly can sway me. Xseed is often pretty good at it, with one of my favorites being their three-disc set of music from the whole E series, included with Memories of Celseta. Final Fantasy XIII 2 also got a great special edition, with the full proper four-disc soundtrack being included in the game case itself. Now, sure, I do generally prefer Japanese composers, and Japanese soundtrack CD releases do seem to be more common, but I do have a few sets for American games, too. My favorite American composer is Jake Kaufman, or Vert, who is well known for his work on Way Forward games, particularly the Shantae series. Admittedly, probably a big reason I love his music is because it's not afraid to call attention to how awesome it is, rather than blend into the background like so much other Western music. So even though Jake has offered his music at pay what you want pricing for years, I couldn't help but grab Limited Run's physical CDs for the first three Shantae games. And of course, you'd better believe that the promise of a physical soundtrack set was enough to get me to up my pledge for the Shovel Knight Kickstarter. Here's an interesting case. Amazon offers print-on-demand services for legitimately sold digital albums. I figured I'd test it out with Mist and Riven. The quality isn't amazing, but do you think these could be considered official releases? So now I want to loop back around to Nintendo. Over the years, Nintendo has released a number of really good soundtrack sets in Japan. This includes complete two-disc soundtracks for Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, and The Wind Waker. But unfortunately, Nintendo's Wind Waker soundtrack, which is of course amazing, ended up being their last complete Zelda soundtrack release for a very long time. In fact, Nintendo more or less just stopped producing full soundtrack sets for several years. However, a 
few started to get released exclusively through Club Nintendo, primarily Club Nintendo Japan. This was Nintendo's old loyalty rewards program, but the North American branch was notorious for having the worst rewards, virtually never including CDs. Now Europe did get some of the Club Nintendo soundtracks, but for most of the soundtracks for most of the people in the West, the only way to really get them was through Japanese resellers on eBay or whatever. Thankfully, I was aware of the Japanese Super Mario Galaxy Club Nintendo soundtrack when it released, and I was able to get it without any trouble. The Platinum version, which is a complete soundtrack across two discs. But then I kind of stopped paying close attention to Club Nintendo Japan for a number of years, then all of a sudden I discovered that I'd missed a few that I really would have wanted. Fortunately, I found the Club Nintendo Super Mario Galaxy 2 soundtrack for a reasonable enough price at a convention years ago, but it just kills me that I missed the Kirby's Return to Dreamland soundtrack before it became pretty much unobtainable. But luckily, after that crushing disappointment, I did manage to snag several other Club Nintendo soundtracks. Like, check this out. Did you know that Kid Icarus Uprising got a Club Nintendo CD? Unbelievable soundtrack and Kirby Triple Deluxe, which I think is a bit underrated among the new Kirby games, and it of course has amazing music as Kirby always does. I think this is a pretty big one, The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds. I just think it's so great having all of this music inspired by A Link to the Past on physical CDs. few Wii U ones. Super Mario 3D World in particular is one of the coolest CD sets I own. I'll admit that I overall prefer the music in the Galaxy games, but what sets the 3D World soundtrack apart is all of the musical themed artwork that I believe was made just for this set. I don't know of anywhere else that these drawings of all of the characters with musical instruments exists. Mario Kart 8 also got an impressive two-disc Club Nintendo soundtrack, which even includes music from the DLC tracks. One of the last things you could get through Club Nintendo, this time even in North America, was a Super Smash Bros. soundtrack with one disc for 3DS and another for Wii U. This was pretty huge, I've gotta say. Thankfully, the demise of Club Nintendo has not been the end of Nintendo CDs. More than you might have realized were released for sale in Japan during the waning years of Club Nintendo and since then. Nintendo has been releasing some pretty over-the-top big box sets for Fire Emblem soundtracks, like this one for Awakening. They've also been making these huge Pokemon Super Music collections in recent years. The one I have is for X and Y. And thankfully, those awesome Kirby soundtracks are no longer locked behind Club Nintendo. It's pretty easy to get the phenomenal Kirby Planet Robobot soundtrack from Amazon Japan. It also has some of my absolute favorite disc art. Big spoiler warning if you're a Kirby Superstar fan and haven't played Planet Robobot yet, but check this out. Well, if you've played the game, it's pretty cool, trust me. There's also this Kirby Cafe CD that has some laid back remixes used in one of those promotional cafe things that Japan does. And of course, Nintendo released a two disc Splatoon soundtrack or Splatoon if you prefer. The fun thing with this one is that it offers four alternate covers that you can place in the front. Something that went completely under my radar for a few months was that while Nintendo never released a proper full soundtrack for The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, they did release a Twilight Princess HD soundtrack. Better late than never, and I think it's a pretty nice set. Nintendo has done a few other cool things with Zelda music lately. Of course, there's the Zelda 30th Anniversary Concert, which came in this really nice box and included some nice goodies. I particularly like the Zelda 30th Anniversary Game Music Collection because it's the first CD set I've bought that includes Zelda music from the NES, SNES, Game Boy, and DS. The Super Mario Bros. 30th Anniversary set is a real treat for similar reasons. It helps me feel like my Mario music library is much more comprehensive now. Well. That's more than enough talk about my soundtracks, but the versions that I have aren't necessarily the only ones that were ever made. And you can't be sure that the one you're thinking about buying is an official release. To talk about that, I'm gonna need a little help. Uh. 
Oh, try breaking into my house again. And did you bring your entire soundtrack collection? Um, yeah, well, most of them, but I know you also collect a few soundtrack sets, so I thought maybe we could compare a few different print variations? Well, I do have a few soundtracks, but I kind of stick to the role-playing games. I guess I can get them. I got a couple of Final Fantasy soundtracks. I know you like to collect those as well. I do have to have them. So my Final Fantasy IV here, I was always disappointed. This one is kind of crappy. It doesn't look that nice. Mm -hmm. It's only one disc. The tracks don't loop. Right, they play through one time. And I have the original first pressing here, which kind of has a different uh, set of artwork, which is nice. Yeah, very unique sort of packaging. And what I like is on the back, You've got this old-fashioned square brand logo. Yeah, so that's the original for those old releases, the NTT releases for yeah. the catalog. Mine now. says Squaresoft. Now, you talked about those non-looping tracks on right. the 4 soundtrack. Well, Square Enix did release a Final Fantasy IV soundtrack remaster. So this was after the merger. Yes, and this has loops, and it also has a couple additional tracks, but most of those or some sound effects tones and things like that. Man, I'd like to rip that one. Yeah, it's pretty good. So you've got a first print of Final Fantasy V, is that right? Yeah, I like to collect the first prints just because they have some added artwork and things like that. This one is pretty old. You can see it's a little dinge, a little dinge on that outer. It's character, color. character. Yeah, that's what we'll call it. But it has the booklet and it actually has two uh, unique CD case cover arts compared to the one that you seem to have here. Right, which is just the plain white uh, Squaresoft on the back. Not a lot of anything exciting going on here. There's just a, a slightly different blue on disc one and disc two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pretty boring, but that is really cool. I had no idea that the original print was actually different. Yeah, they like to do some sort of special edition thing for that first pressing a lot of times. And Square Enix reprint of Final Fantasy V as well. Yep, they did another remaster. However, unlike the Final Fantasy IV version, the Final Fantasy V remaster doesn't really add anything new. Now with Final Fantasy V, I threw away the slipcover. I was smart enough to not do so with Final Fantasy VI, so I've got the complete thing here. Mm -hmm. And it looks like they did another Square Enix Reprint. Yeah, the same sort of situation with 5. They called it a remaster, but the sounds are pretty identical, and there is no additional looping or extra added sounds in this one. That's interesting they did that, and they did it with 9 as well? Good question. No, they did Final Fantasy 9. This is simply a reprint under the Square Enix brand. I know you have the second release. Right, there was a one with weird character cutouts was the first edition. I actually yeah. intentionally did not order that one back in the day because I thought that looks weird. But when this one came out, I ordered it right away. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but yours looks, it's almost the identical packaging, but on the side, mine says DigiCube. Yep. And, and yours this is says Square, Square Enix. Enix. Yep. And then Final Fantasy IX Plus, this is kind of a weird situation where Final Fantasy IX was, could not fit on four discs. Yeah, and they took the sort of orchestral, more orchestral sounding music. The FMV and stuff like that. But again, they're identical, it's just that Square Enix rebrand. The funny thing about this one is there's actually a typo on it that says Square Sounds. Square? Square Sounds, but on the inside, on the disc itself, it says Square sounds. Oh, that's a bit of a, that's a bit of a mistake. Maybe that's why they did the re-releases of not that. That that's gotta be the only reason. Yeah, it's gotta be. So I've got a few other RPG soundtracks. Okay. Skies of Arcadia, great game, great soundtrack. Mm -hmm. The yeah. Japanese version is called Eternal Arcadia. Hey, those ain't real. We gotta talk about bootlegs. Hey, bro, my soundtracks. Man, you got a, a whopping big collection there, Corey. Yeah, you better believe it. Yeah. So these do look the same. They look the same, but they're different. Okay. Well, I thought from the beginning that mine was kind of suspicious because this cover looks really generic, mm -hmm. but Corey's real one looks pretty much the same. Yeah, same cover art. Yep, but flip it over. 
and mine has this suspicious logo on the back that says Son May Records. It's even got this email address. Mm -hmm. It's kind of shady. And you open them up, and they've got completely different artwork on the discs. Mm -hmm. And mine has a spine card. Ooh. <laughs> Son May was one of the many companies that made bootleg soundtracks. Well, it's funny you say that. I, <laughs> early on in my soundtrack collecting career, had some issues because I didn't know what to look for. I didn't know what companies manufactured these soundtracks, so I just bought them up. My initial collection was mostly bootlegs, especially with Final Fantasy. Like, when you're looking for a Final Fantasy soundtrack, you have to be super careful. You will very likely end up with a bootleg because you're going to see that price. You're going to think, oh, well, that's, that's not bad. Even for the big four disc ones, but, oh, 30 bucks for Final Fantasy VII? Great. And then you're like, ever anime? Not so great, because that is another bootleg company. But if we look at this FF4, you can see some of the other comparison issues. Right, mine has a trademark on it, which is a good sign. Yes, and mine does not. Looks clean, but that means they couldn't legally put that logo on there. And right. Now, my, the my FF4, I feel like it, it, it's just not that great looking mm -hmm. of a product, but it's got that Critical Square Soft logo on the disc and on the case, which... In your experience, I believe you told me you have never seen an official release that didn't have the company name somewhere on it. Especially with uh, the soundtracks for role-playing games, it's almost 100%. I have yet to see a bootleg soundtrack release that had the official company logo somewhere on it. Because if we look here, no Squaresoft. I mean, they really, they try to make them look as close to the original as possible but they can't put that on there. I believe there's some legal reason where they can still produce these without getting into trouble, but they cannot put those company logos on. Usually they're mostly made in Taiwan. Yeah, you'll see a lot of them are Taiwanese. Yeah, actually my Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy VIII have this Made in Taiwan sticker on the back. Mm -hmm. And you know, if I had actually looked at these closely when I got them, <laughs> I just didn't think that deeply about it. But I mean, there they are. I should have realized eh, something fishy is going on here. If you look inside on my Final Fantasy VII, uh, it's got that San Mei blazing across the back. Yeah, and I have actually another bootleg, which, like I said, is the Ever Anime bootleg. Again, very similar looking. Yeah, it's got the slip case and everything. But mine says Final Fantasy VII International. Which you would think that, ooh, this is a special reprinting for the new International Edition that they released in Japan. But musically, it's identical, it's so identical. what would, no you know, that's a red flag right there. Yeah, and the fact that it's inconsistent. Like, it'll say international in some spots, and I believe in the manual that it doesn't. Which is very odd. You think it would say Final Fantasy VII International on the front. Huge red flag for you. But then when you You've get the got original. the real one here. Yeah, and the big thing for Final Fantasy soundtracks, especially in that PlayStation era, is they release with this DigiCube formatting logo. Yes, that was a subsidiary of Squaresoft at the time that they sold a lot of merch with, including soundtracks. So Digicube, good. Not suspicious. Okay, guys. I'm familiar with Sanmei and Ever Anime, but who else do I have to look out for? Well, my Final Fantasy XI pile here is not very good. Uh, I have to, of course, have all the Final Fantasy XI expansion soundtracks, but I didn't know what I was looking for at the time, really. So, Rise of the Zillart. This is published by Allian International Records Company Limited. Another common one. Uh, Chains of Promethea. This one was KO Trading Company Limited. Uh, we've got Treasures of Otter Gone. This is Mia Records, and you can tell with this uh, Mika product code, uh, that kind of goes hand in hand, and then Wings of the Goddess, here's another KO. And, you know, unfortunately, this pile I've got here has a number of these same three, in addition to Ever Anime and Sanmei. Yeah, and the same thing has happened to me before, especially with Final Fantasy XI. I wanted that limited edition release of Final Fantasy XI. It had this cool slip cover. I was like, oh, that, there it is. There it is. Looks great, right? Final Fantasy XI. Sure enough, uh, it's the same one you have, which is a bootleg from Allian International. Now, with all these bootlegs floating around, it can be tricky for people who don't want to go through the steps to check for certain logos and everything. I wanted to replace all of my bootleg soundtracks once I became aware, because I had an Ever Anime Suikoden in 2. Suikoden is my favorite game series. I had to have the soundtracks and they needed them legit. And there's a great website, Video Game Music Database, which is vgmdb.net. 
It has all of the catalog numbers for every official release, as well as the bootlegs. Almost all of the bootlegs are covered. And you might think that the bootlegs would just use the same code as the official release to try to blend in even more, but they're all different. They all have their unique identification numbers. Yeah, because they were actually sold and somehow they're getting away with this. Okay guys, really though, does it matter? I mean, is, this, is the sound quality different between the bootlegs and the real copies? I'm sure that bit by bit, they're identical copies. They've got to be. I mean, they're digital, so it should You be. would think so. I mean, me personally, since I bought them with the intent of buying the real thing, it doesn't really bother me that in the end it's kind of fake. Yeah, see, I'm a little bit different, though it is a nice excuse for me because I like to rip all my soundtracks to my computer. I have the fake Suikoden in 2 soundtrack ripped, and then I don't have to open the real ones. Just keep them sealed. Why not? You know, at least all mine are real. Well, when you have such a huge collection, that's that's pretty impressive. But if you look at this Chrono Trigger, I don't know, it looks a little funky to me. I don't know. Well, what about you? Well, this is correct. Your, yours looks, looks a little weird, too. No, it's got the double disc style. It's got the well, correct I mean, art. Have her anime. Are you serious? Yeah, see, it has to have the square. Yeah, I have a Sun May one. Crap. Square Soft. Well, it's been fun, guys, going through our bootleg and official release soundtracks. We got a lot of tips about how to check them. I've got some bootlegs that I need to replace. You guys have a lot to clean up here, so I will see you guys later, all right? <laughs>